Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Suspense. The adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Dragnet. And now, Gangbusters. Welcome to the Film Detective Podcast, where we bring you theater of the mind programming from the golden age of radio. I'm your host, Carl Amari. This time, it's a 1948 radio comedy episode of Fibber, McGee, and Molly starring Jim and Mary and Jordan. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Film Detective, your one-stop shop for classic film and television. Looking forward to classic names like Judy Garland, Audrey Hepburn, Humphrey Bogart, or Marlon Brando? We've got you covered. But don't worry, we don't skimp on the rare cult classics. Comedy, mystery, film noir, western, thriller, or drama. We're on the case. Who are you? The Film Detective. Vintage Films. Reborn. Fibber McGee and Molly had a long and successful run on radio from 1935 until 1959. The program showcased terrific comic and musical talent. Headlined by its co-creators and stars, Jim and Marion Jordan, they were a real-life husband and wife team that had been working in radio since the 1920s. Living in the fictional Midwestern town of Wistful Vista, Fibber was an American teller of tall tales and lovable bragger, usually to the exasperation of his long-suffering wife, Molly. Life in Wistful Vista followed a well-developed formula, but was always fresh. Fibber's weekly schemes would be interrupted, inspired by, and often played upon the people of Wistful Vista. Regular characters included Mayor Latrivia, played by Gail Gordon, Doc Gamble, played by Arthur Q. Bryan, Mrs. Uppington, played by Isabel Randolph, Wallace Wimple, played by Bill Thompson, and Fibber's next-door neighbor, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, played by Hal Perry. In the peak of the show's success in the 1940s, it was adapted for the silver screen in a series of feature films, an attempt to bring the series to TV in 1959 with a different cast and new writers was both a critical and commercial failure, proving that success in one medium is no guarantee of success in another. In this 1948 radio episode, Fibber builds a lamp out of a pewter teapot. Here's Fibber McGee and Molly. The Johnson's Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> The makers of Johnson's Wax Products for Home and Industry present Fibber McGee and Molly with Bill Thompson, Gail Gordon, Arthur Q. Bryan, and me, Harlow Wilcox. The script is by Don Quinn and Phil Leslie. Music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. <laughs> Women who have been using Johnson's self-polishing glow coat for years now like it even better than ever. And here's why. Glow Coat has been improved. The new Johnson self-polishing glow coat now shines nearly twice as bright as ever before. Try it and you'll see the difference in an instant. Glow Coat will make your kitchen linoleum glow with a bright new beauty. That brighter glow coat shine will make your linoleum and other floors look years younger. And at the same time, it'll make them last years longer. That gleaming coat of tough wax takes the punishment and helps protect your linoleum from wear. It's mighty easy to use, too. You merely apply and let dry. There's no rubbing or buffing. A gleaming glow coat surface is a surface easy to keep clean. Dust, dirt, and spilled things can be whisked away with just a wipe of a damp cloth. Be sure to try the improved Johnson self-polishing glow coat. More than ever, it's the better way to bring out the beauty of the home. Look on the bright side, shine up the right side, bring out the beauty of the home. When a housewife like Mrs. Molly McGee starts gazing thoughtfully around the living room with that I wonder how much it would cost to redecorate look in her eyes, it's high time that a man like Mr. McGee, who's been pinching the budget for a new bowling ball, did some fast thinking. Like right now, as we join Fibber McGee and Molly. Now, let me tell 
Let me see. If the walls were painted sort of a dusty green and the ceiling an off-white, this carpet would still be all right. Hey, Molly, you know what month this is? Yes, February. And we've got to get that old floor lamp out of here. Huh? It's been knocked over so many times it ducks whenever we come into the room. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've been thinking that if we have the walls painted a dusty You green... said it, kiddo. That floor lamp is a nuisance. It used to have three speeds. Yeah, I know. Dim, flicker, and out. <laughs> Let's get rid of it. Fine. That's a good start. Now, I was thinking... You were thinking? What do you think I've been doing lying here studying this popular mechanics magazine my head off? <laughs> I've been studying how to make a beautiful new lamp, Molly. A new lamp out of an old spittoon. <laughs> Ain't that a coincidence for you? Well, it's a coincidence, sweetheart, but not for me. Huh? In the first place, while cuspidors may have a certain historic charm and look cute in the windows of antique shops, I want none of them in my living room. Even made into a lamp with flowers growing out in it? I wouldn't want one if it were made into a crystal chandelier with sunny tufts growing out of it. <laughs> now look, McGee, this living room needs a needs new... Needs a new lamp. You bet it does, baby. And I'm just the guy that can whip one up for you. Who was it that made all the best stuff in my eighth grade manual training class back in Peoria? Little Charlie Carell. Yeah, and he had the bench right next to me, and I saw how he did everything. <laughs> Throw that old floor lamp out, Snooky, before the sun sets tonight. I'm going to make you a new one. A new lamp now, and maybe next year we can have the whole room redecorated. Huh? We uh, can't do it this year? I don't see how, baby. I'll know better after March 15th. And if you see me laughing while I pay our income tax, don't get alarmed. I'll be reaching so far down for the dough, I'll be tickling my own feet. <laughs> Oh, boy. Every year. Come in. Oh, hi, old-timer. Hello, Mr. Old-timer. Hello there, kids. What you doing? <laughs> I was just about to start making a new table lamp out of something old, timer. <clears throat> you know anything about handicraft? Nope. Only member of my family that took manual training was my brother. What was his name? Manual. Oh. <laughs> manual trained to be a blacksmith. Yeah. Mighty good one, too. Yeah. I can close my eyes and see old Manuel yet, standing in the barn basement on a stepladder, reaching up to shoe a horse. On a ladder in the basement? Reaching up to shoe a horse. Well, now, kids, a horse don't just sit in a chair and stick his foot out and say, that's very nice, but have you got the same thing an alligator like people do? <laughs> a horse just stands there. <laughs> Yes, but... So, Manuel, he cut a hole in the barn floor, hired a kid to lead a horse over the hole till the proper hoof was showing, then he'd run downstairs, climb up the ladder, and glue the shoe on. Look, old-timer, in the first place, all that stuff isn't necessary. You just pick up one foot at a time and put the shoe on. And you don't glue the shoe on, you nail it on. Yeah, nails. Nail it on? Oh, daughter, I'm disappointed in you. Huh? Stand there so sweet and gentle-looking and suggesting somebody hammer nails into a dumb animal? Man's best oh, friend. Oh, but it don't hurt them. They haven't got any feeling in their hoofs. How do you know, Johnny? You ever been a horse? <laughs> Why, of course he hasn't been. Well, I have. I don't want anybody nailing my shoes on. What do you mean, you were a horse? Well, I wasn't a complete horse, Johnny. Just the front end. <laughs> Me and another fellow, we was a horse in circus once. Oh. But he got the heaves one summer and had to quit the act. <laughs> well, I've always wanted to know a horse personally to speak to. Would you care for some nice, fresh oatmeal cookies? <laughs> <laughs> Next to <be> good, daughter. <laughs> That ain't the way I heard it. <laughs> How did you hear it? Well, the way I heard it, Johnny, one feller says to tell the feller, say, he says, I see where Russia's just passed a law where they ain't allowed to talk to foreigners. That's pretty silly, says to the feller. They're all foreigners themselves. <laughs> well, good luck shooting your horse, Johnny. So long, daughter. <laughs> Well, now, let me see. First, I get the shoe red hot and then the nail. Hey, what am I? I'm not shoeing a horse. I'm going to make a table lamp. That's what you said anyway, but out of what? Oh, I'll find something. Well, while you try to think of it, I'll run upstairs and vacuum the guest room. Okay. Let me know now what you decide to use. Okay, Tootsie. Ah, oh, there goes a good kid. 
What does she care if I'm not very handy at making things? As long as I'm kind and generous and tactful and sweet and quiet and understanding and tolerant and patient and gentle and <laughs> unassuming and modest. <laughs> hey, my guys, here's just the thing to make a lamp out of. This old pewter teapot. Oh, boy, this'll be a cinch. All I gotta do is get the... Wa- Uh-oh. Come in. Hi, mister. Oh, hi, teeny. Where's Miss McGee? Where is she? <laughs> She's upstairs, sis. Vacuum the guest room. Why? Well, gee, mister, she almost never seems to be here when I come in. Yeah, I noticed that. I thought maybe she didn't like little children or something. <laughs> no, it's just a coincidence, I guess, Teeny. She's very fond of little children. Hey, hey, what you doing with the teapot, mister? What you doing with it? What you... Hmm. Shh, not so loud, sis. I'm going to make a lamp out of this and surprise my wife. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'll be dandy, I bet yeah. you. That's an awful pretty teapot. You think so? Well, I... Hmm? I said you think so? Think what? That it's very pretty. What is? This teapot. What about it? I think it's very pretty. Gee, I do too, I bet mm. you. <laughs> Gee, that's one of the prettiest silver teapots I ever saw, mister. Ah, but it isn't silver, sis. It's pewter. Gee, honest? Yep. My brother used to raise pewter pigeons once, but all the neighbors... No. <laughs> Not, not powder, pewter. This teapot is made of pewter. It's a metal. An alloy, rather. You know what an alloy is, sis? Oh. <laughs> hmm? Oh, everybody knows that, mister. An alloy is a little thin streak that runs behind people's garages. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're just kidding me, I betcha. Look, sis, I've always said that the day you don't learn at least one thing is a day wasted. Now you take pewter. Okay. Pewter is an alloy, which in this case is a combination of three metals. Silver, nickel, and pute. <laughs> pute is a rare metal that is found only on the west coast of Putagonia. Pute has to be mined very quickly because it spoils when exposed to the air. Thus we get the term uh, putrefy. If it spoils, it's no good except for fertilizer, which they spread on the fields to raise the putunias and putatas. And... <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It sure is, mister. Mm. Mm, thanks ever so much. That's okay, Tanya. You learn more about it when you start studying botany and geometry and stuff. Oh, I know what geometry is now, I bet you. Oh, you do, eh? Well, what is it? <laughs> come on, come on. Tell me, what's geometry, if you know? <laughs> ah. Geometry. Geometry is... Well, geometry is what the little acorn said when it grew up. Huh? Geometry. Oh. <laughs> I bet you we both learned something today, I bet you. Mm. Goodbye now. Yeah, maybe we have, but I haven't learned to keep my big fat mouth shut in front of that midget. <laughs> Billy Mills in the orchestra, and I've got a feeling I'm falling.
can't let her see this now. Uh, I'm in the dining room, Molly, but don't come in. This is confidential. Now, wait a minute. I'm coming out. Throw this tablecloth over there. You want me for something, Molly? Nothing in particular, McGee. What are you doing? Oh, it's a surprise. I'll show it to you when I get it finished. Is it the lamp? Yep, and is it ever going to be beautiful? Oh, good. This is the best thing I've made since that saddle I hand-tooled for Mayor Moore. You mean Mort Moore, the mayor of Miramar? Yeah. Remember the saddle I hand-tooled for him and that little mare of his name, Mary? Well, I vaguely remember. Sure, you remember Mayor Mort Moore of Miramar and his little mare, Mary? <laughs> The minute I seen Mort's mare, I says, Moore, I says, that's a very merry little mare. And he says, yes, he says, the mare the merrier. And further, mare is the mare of Miramar. My mare, Mary, is more than any mere mare in Miramar. And I says, that's merely mare of people. Come in, point killer. It's Mr. Williams, the weatherman. Hello, Mr. Williams. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, McGee. Hi, Foggy. Where have you been keeping yourself? Yes, we haven't seen you since last Tuesday. Well, <laughs> I've been busy at the office all week with some experiments. No kidding, Foggy. Ever make any artificial lightning? Well, yes, once, but that was strictly inadvertent. Oh. How on earth could you make lightning accidentally? I dropped a nickel, it bounced into a wall plug, and I tried to pry it out with a hairpin. <laughs> Gosh, that was a pretty dumb maneuver, Foggy. What happened? There was a sheet of blue flame which burned my trousers off at the knees, and I was hurled violently backward into the lap of a very attractive young lady. Having made her so conspicuous, I felt it my duty to ask her to marry me. Oh. Oh. Isn't that the most romantic thing you ever heard, McGee? Yeah I'm going to get Mrs. Williams to tell me all about it Uh, please don't, Mrs. McGee This was another girl Oh <laughs> You mean the one you fell over refused to marry her? Yes, yes, she said she wouldn't marry a man who was idiotic enough to stick hairpins into the light sockets <laughs> Well, you ought to tell Mrs. Williams, Mr. Williams. I imagine she'd get a big laugh out of it. Yeah. Yes, yes. And when she stopped laughing, there would be a slight pause, and she would ask me how I happened to have a hairpin with me. <laughs> how did you? That is a long story which I haven't time to invent just now. <laughs> Good day. <laughs> Probably. That's rather sweet and old-fashioned, McGee. What, getting caught with a hairpin in your pocket? No. Thinking you have to ask a girl to marry you just because you fell into her lap. Yeah. As the guy says when he sat on the phonograph needle, this is positively mid-Victrolian. Oh. <laughs> well, back to work, kiddo. Oh, I had a little doggy who was an awful fool, half spits and half retriever, which resulted in a drool. <laughs> oh, the monkey and the dog, let me see. Ah, bless his little heart. He'll save me $7 with his homemade table lamp, and it'll cost us $75 to put the dining room back together again. Ah, oh, well. Hi, Molly. Hi. Hey, where's Fibber? He's in the dining room, Mr. Wilcox. Can't you hear him? Hey, pal. What are you doing? Oh, hi, Junior. I'm working on a little surprise for Molly. I'm making a table lamp, but she don't know what oughta. She what? I said she don't know what oughta. <laughs> she don't know what oughta? No. What he means, Mr. Wilcox, is that he's making me a table lamp, but I'm totally ignorant of what particular properties he is utilizing in its construction. That's what I says. <laughs> she knows I'm making a lamp, but she don't know what outta. <laughs> That's plain English, ain't it? <laughs> plain is positively homely. But look, what brought on this burst of creative construction, pal? Well, we need some new things for this uh, living room, Mr. Wilcox, but we're settling for a new table lamp, which himself here is dreaming up with a hunk of wire, the neighbor's tools, and some materials about which I remain in happy ignorance. Yeah, she knows I'm making it, but she don't know what oughta. <laughs> <laughs> well... Personally, Molly, I've always thought this living room was completely charming. Your whole house is, for that matter. Oh, Mr. Wilcox, how about that tall old floor lamp? That thing is more dated than a cigar counter sales girl. <laughs> well, the lamp may be yes, but the rest of your things are in fine shape. Your whole house gleams with hospitality. You know, I particularly like your kitchen. Oh, now, Mr. Wilcox, you... You know, if every woman knew, as you know, that Johnson's glow coat beautifies your linoleum as it protects, saves time and labor, and makes build things so much easier to wipe up, they'd have a lot more time to watch their husbands make table lamps. Lots of women haven't got husbands with enough talent to make table lamps. I'll bet when you first found out that glow coat needs no rubbing or buffing and dry 
eyes in 20 minutes yeah. or less to a handsome, color-brightening finish? Yeah, yeah. Look, waxy. Yes, pal. <laughs> You gotta hurry away. As a matter of fact, I have, yes. Why? I'm cooking dinner for Spaniel Eyes tonight. Oh? My own recipe for stew. Oh, isn't that nice? Mm-hmm. You're going to cook a stew for your wife. Yeah, but she don't know what out of. <laughs> See you later, folks. <laughs> Back to work. I'll see where's my hacksaw. Oh, here it is. Oh, I had a little marmoset, a handy little sinner. He'd help marmoset the table almost every night for dinner. Oh, the monkey and the coconut. Hey, Molly, we got any scotch tape? No, Uncle Dennis used it all up when he was packing his bags to leave. What do you need all that scotch tape for? He said his scotch was always shaking loose. Oh. <laughs> oh, I had a little crocodile. Come here. in. Hello there, Mr. Wimple. Do come in. Hi there, Wimp. Be with you in just a sec. Hello, folks. <laughs> My, this is a familiar scene. Husband in one room, wife in the other room, sitting with their backs to each other. <laughs> Makes me kind of homesick. He's making me a table lamp, Mr. Wimple, but he doesn't want me to see it until it's finished. Yeah. She knows I'm making it, Wimp, but she don't know what oughta. You ever do much handicraft work? Well, no, not much, Mr. McGee. I just watch birds and write greeting cards. Still making a bum out of Longfellow, eh? Mm -hmm. Have you written a valentine to your wife yet? Two of them. Would you like to hear the one I'm sending her anonymously? Oh, I'd love to, Mr. Wimple. (laughs) I've always been fond of poetry anyway. Edgar Guest came to visit us once. The room he slept in, we still refer to as the guest room. Go ahead, Wimp. Let's hear the poem. All righty. It goes to Sweetie Face, my valentine. Mm. Here's to you, my sweet valentine, with the heart and the lace and the old familiar line. For year after year, I've been writing this stuff. If you had any sense, you would know it was guff. (laughs) No, you just grab it with tears in your eyes and read it like it was a tremendous surprise. I'm afraid it's the last you'll be getting from me, Because Cupid is stupid, do you have to be? (laughs) Not very sentimental, is it, Mr. Wimp? Well, with Wimp's setup, I don't imagine he has very many sentimental moments, do you, Wimp? Oh, I used to, Mr. McGee. Yeah? I remember one summer when I was first married to you-know-who. Yeah. (laughs) We were out canoeing one night. Yeah. There wasn't any moon, and it was so dark, and I said, Sweetie face, I said... Let's just drift and hold hands and not say a word to each other. Oh, wasn't that sweet. (laughs) Yes. And then I filled one of my gloves with wet sand, gave it to her to hold, slipped over the side, swam ashore, and played snooker till almost midnight. (laughs) (laughs) That's a sign. The King's Men and the Secretary Song. Down at the office, they're all agog. The old typewriter has a new stenog. She has a brand new trick. She types to a red hot lick. From nine to five all week, you ought to see her technique. Beepity bop bop, beepity bop bop, space. Beepity bop bop, type the letters in place. Beepity bop bop, and you'll never go wrong with the Mary Secretary song. Beepity bop bop, beepity bop bop, dot. Beepity bop bop, you're improving a lot. Beepity bop bop, as you rock it along, that's the Mary Secretary song. She has a lot of fun when her work is done. The fellas gather round in a bunch. Cause they can hardly wait to see the one she'll date When she's off from twelve to one Lunch! Beepity bop bop, that's the beat she plays Beepity bop bop, do it right, get a raise Beepity bop bop, keep the rhythm strong With the Mary Secretary song Beepity bop bop, beepity bop bop, dash Beepity bop, she's quick as a flash Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid the Mary Secretary song. Beepity bop bop, beepity bop bop, quote. Beepity beep bop, just look what she wrote. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy. The Mary Secretary song. 
She has a lot of fun when her work is all done Cause the fellas gather round in a bunch They can hardly wait to see the one she'll date When she's off from twelve to one Luncheon, beepity bop bop, her typewriter plays Beepity bop bop, oh, she'll get a raise Beepity bop bop, beepity bop The Mary Mary Secretary song that just came special delivery from the Bon Ton. Shall I open it for no, you, No, 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 no. I should say not, kiddo. Thanks anyway. Just hand it here. And don't look at what I'm doing. All right. I've got my head turned away. Much obliged. Now, you go back and sit down, Tootsie. I'll have this lamp finished in nothing flat. And believe me, it's the best job I've ever done. There's going to be a lot of scorched eyeballs around here if people won't be able to take their eyes off this lamp like I don't think they will. How's that again, dearie? I says if people won't be able to take their eyes off this lamp like I don't think they will, there'll be a lot of scorched eye... Come in. For goodness sakes, Dr. Gamble. Come right in, Doctor. Thank you, my dear. And where is little Limber Lip today? <laughs> oh, he's just in the dining room there. Here I am, Doc. Be with you in just a sec. What's he doing in there? Well, he's making me a table lamp, Doctor. What out of? <laughs> I don't know what out of. A table lamp. Hmm. I hope you won't be hurt, my dear, if I get under the table the first time he turns it on. Oh, no. Just make room for me is all, because I like... Hi there, old fever blister. What made you run away from the hospital at this time of day? Somebody come in with a contagious disease? (laughs) To me, slack-jaw, germs are far less repulsive than some of the larger forms of animal life. Hmm. Anything personal in that remark? What do you think? I don't think so. You're just modest. Thank you. Not at all. (laughs) Pardon me, Alphonse and Gaston, but uh, I'd like to know how you're getting along with my table lamp, McGee. Oh, baby, it's going to be a Lulu. The best job I've ever done. I'm making Molly a table lamp, uh, Doc, but she don't know how to hop from what. <laughs> <laughs> when will the lowbrow public be permitted to behold this hand-soldered epic, Chisel Fizzle? Yes, I'm getting <laughs> very impatient, dearie. Remember, you promised I'd have it today. He keeps promises like I keep a 29-inch waistline. <laughs> Nevertheless, Medicine Ball, when I make a promise, I make a promise. My motto is never break a promise to a child or a woman. Grown men can look after themselves. Give me five minutes, Molly. Five minutes it is, McGee. Come on, Doc. You can lend me a surgical hand. Oh, are you using hands on this? Everything you've built up till now, I thought you made with your teeth and your elbows. You have four minutes and 50 seconds, dearie. Oh, come on, Doc. Come in when I call you, Molly. Take a peek under that tablecloth, Doc. Uh-huh. That's the lamp. I filled it with cement to give it some weight, and then I bored a hole through the bottom, wired it up through here, see? And I bought this blue and silver lampshade at the bon time. Hand me that wire, will you? Here you are. <laughs> and while it hurts me to say this, my boy, that is really a beautiful lamp. Betcha. A pewter teapot with that blue and silver shade was pure inspiration. Yeah, you said it. Now let me turn it on, see if it works. Perfect. Ah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, here's the shade. A handsome one it is, too. Thanks. It cost me three seventy nine, dollars but when I get in a creative mood like this, cost means nothing. <laughs> Hold her steady while I screw it on. Okay. Ah, there we are. Time's up, McGee. And it's all finished. Throw that tablecloth over it again, Doc. We'll unveil it like the beautiful thing it is. Okay. Uh... My dear, you have a great surprise in store for you. Heavenly days, I'm so excited. Don't keep me in suspense any longer, McGee. Let's see it. Okay, now you stand right over there where you can get the best view of it. When I count to three, Doc, you yank the tablecloth off. (laughs) It will be a pleasure to yank the sheet off something that won't peer up at me and ask how big the incision will be. (laughs) You ready? One. I was just going to say, McGee, it's a good thing you're finished with that because I've got to run over to Mrs. Williams. Over to Foggy Williams's? What for? Just to return an antique pewter teapot she loaned me for my party last week. A pew? A pew? She says it doesn't look very valuable, but it was made by Paul Revere himself back in 1768. A pew? Come on, boys, what are we waiting for? A pew? A pew? A pew? Better get his bed ready, my dear. A pew? I think I've got a patient on my hands. A pew, a pew. What's the a matter? A pew, a pew. 
Many times I've said that Genuine Johnson's Paste Wax adds to the beauty of your home. Well, here's an easy way for you to see just how true that statement is. Choose two pieces of furniture or two sections of a floor. Polish one with Johnson's Wax and compare the two. The one you've polished will have a new warm beauty that will make the other seem, well, rather dull and ordinary by comparison. You see, Johnson's Wax adds luster that makes your floors and furniture glow with a delightfully bright richness. That hard, protective coat of shining wax makes all precious things so much more easy to keep clean, too. Dust and dirt won't stick to a surface gleaming with that tough, protective coat of wax. And the same shining coat that makes things easy to clean protects fine finishes from stains and scratches. Try Johnson's Paste Wax. Look at the gleaming, glowing results which bring out the beauty of your home. Look on the bright side, shine up the right side, bring out the beauty of the home. I just talked to Mrs. Williams, McGee. What'd she say, kiddo? What'd she say? Is she awful sore at me? No. <laughs> she thought it made a beautiful lamp. She just loved it. Oh, boy. But she says it depends on what Mr. Williams says. Ain't he home yet? No, he had to take his groundhog to the vet. His groundhog to the vet? What's the matter with it? Shock. Shock? It saw its shadow yesterday and knew it would have six weeks more of Mr. Williams. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah. <laughs> Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> The makers of Johnson's Wax Products, Racine, Wisconsin, bring you Fibber McGee and Molly each Tuesday night. Be with us again next week, won't you? Good night. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. And that's Fibber, McGee, and Molly from February 3rd, 1948, starring Jim and Marion Jordan, sponsored by Johnson's Wax, as heard on NBC. Next time on the Film Detective Podcast, it's a radio episode of Lights Out, so don't miss it. To learn more about this series, visit thefilmdetective.com. See you next time.